that is the highest level of service. Nobody should ever be sitting around thinking, hey, I wonder what happens next. If that's happening, then there's a, there's a breakdown somewhere. Here's something I learned years ago. If the client has to call me, I drop the ball. The client should never have to call me. They should always know what's happening next and then show up to that. And then I'm letting them know I'm staying in front of them. Same thing. Now you do an inspection. Okay. They have the inspection. Okay. Here's what's going to happen next. We're going to create this. Uh, we're going to draft up this addendum. We're going to submit it to the other agent and we're going to, uh, uh, they're going to respond to us and then we'll go back to them. Hey everybody, welcome to our bulletproofing shift. We've been doing these webinars weekly and this week we're focusing on a extremely important topic, which is bulletproofing your transactions. Because if we're going to put these transactions together, we want to make sure they stay together and we want to make sure they get to the closing line. So I'm sharing with you today some strategies and tactics. I don't want to, I, I want to just make sure I give credit uh, from this book shift. That was written by Gary Keller in 2009. And I used it a lot of times to get through some of the uh, shifting markets as I've been in real estate for over 20 years. And it's a great book. So I would definitely encourage you to grab a copy of that book. So let me share my uh, screen with you now. And so this is the um, bulletproofing presentation we're going to through today. I'm going to go through the presentation with you. I'm going to share some slides you know, we'll go through pretty uh, swiftly. And then at the end, I'm going to leave some time for questions for Q&A. So we are going to have a Q&A session. And if you do have questions in between, oh, feel free, just type in the chat. And Sam will, will be uh, looking at the chat and we may address some of the questions during. Otherwise, we'll definitely get to them during the Q&A time. So appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is David Hill. I'm going on 38 years in outbound sales. And I spent, it'll be, November is going to be 20 years in the real estate space. Um, and out of those 20 years, um, I spent my first 17 years with Keller Williams Realty. Um, I was one of their university instructors that used to go around the country and teach. One of the courses I taught was Shift, which is why I'm so passionate about this particular course. I also only taught listings based courses. So I was, uh, I'm definitely a, a fan of listings. Um, Gary Keller's mastermind for a bunch of years because my team was in the top production. And I've, you know, I have a book, the sales playbook, which I wrote in 2016, the 11 simple strategies to get more, to, uh, to, to make more sales, which is a phenomenal book. Um, you can get yourself a copy of that. Uh, also it's a podcast called path to mastery. My guests have included Gary V. Mel Robbins, Brian Tracy, uh, just so many other just absolute rock stars uh, on there. And hey, I've completed an Ironman race in 2017, which my God is life changing. Like if <laughs> I would challenge everybody to do something like that, it, it makes you a different person. And I have got three beautiful daughters and uh, an amazing wife. Um, so let me let me tell you a, a little bit about my uh, story, how I personally got into real estate. I remember my, my 20 year old daughter, uh, well, back then, this is 20 years ago, back then she was 10 and she came home one day and she said, dad, you should get your real estate license. Um, mom's friend Sue makes a, a lot of money selling real estate. And I said, okay, like pretty much ignored her for, but for whatever reason, uh, the next morning I woke up and it was on my mind. And, and I, I just, said, you know what, let me look into the real estate thing. And I did, I, 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 I went through the training, I, you know, I, I, I signed up for the course and, and I got my real estate license, you know, and, and here's the thing, looking back now, it was probably one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten in my life because I, I, it's opened up so many doors for me personally, but you know, now, now jumping back five months later, here I am now, I have my real estate license and I'm getting all these calls from different brokerages. And I, I remember this one guy, Steve Clements, called me and he said, do you want to learn how to make money right out of the gate? And I said, absolutely. So I ended up joining his team. And on the first day, he said, I want you to show up at my office and, and I want you to bring all the, this was on a Sunday, by the way, he wanted me to show up on a Sunday morning. 
and he wanted me to bring all the real estate sections from the local newspapers. So I'm like, okay. So I went out, I got the Herald, the Globe, the Metro West News, the Telegram, all our local papers. I don't even know if half of them are around now. This is 20 years ago. And he goes, I want you to bring um, a, a highlighter, you know, one, one of these things. I want you to bring uh, 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 index cards, you know, a four by six index cards. I want you to bring uh, uh, a scissors and, and scotch tape. And I'm like, what does this stuff have to do with real estate? But anyway, I showed up and, uh, and you know, I showed up with my stuff and we got to the office 10 a.m. on a Sunday. And as soon as we got there, it was me and two other new agents. And he shuffled us right away, ushered us into a conference room. And the first thing he did was he showed us how to look through those real estate sections. And then with the highlighter, we highlighted every real estate ad. Then we cut them out and we taped them on the top left corner of our index cards, just like this. And guys, that was the system back then. I mean, it was clunky. It was antiquated, but it was the system we used to track the for sale by owner leads. He then handed us all scripts and he told us we would read the script over five times each by ourselves. And then we spent about 15 minutes or so role playing back and forth with the other agents. He said, okay, great. Let's get those phones out. And I remember, okay, let's go. We pulled out our phones and he said, we're going to call these for sale by owners. And I'll be honest, I was pretty nervous. <laughs> Even though I had a lot of experience on the phones, I was still pretty nervous. This was new to me. Um, I never called people. I always only called businesses. And uh, and anyway, I remember my first call. Uh, I, I was like, yeah, yeah. Hi, this is uh, David uh, with, uh, and I was, before I could even finish, they were just like, yeah, yeah, we're all set. Click. They sensed my nervousness, right? <laughs> then on the second call, you know, I, I called again and, and uh, I was like, yeah, hi, this is uh, David Hill with Keller and and again, super nervous. They, they must have sent They're like, hey, buddy, no, no, we don't need a realtor. We're all set. If we need a realtor, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. And they hung up. And Steve was like, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. So then on my third call, I used Steve's script again. And, and this time I got a little bit further, but the seller didn't end up saying, you know, they were more polite, but they were like, yeah, yeah, no, listen, we're all set. We, we have a, a family member that's a real estate agent. And if we need any help, we're going to use them. So have a good day. And then and politely hung up on me. And Steve was like, yeah, this is, uh, this is good. This is normal. This is fine. Keep going. So now on the fourth call, I said, Hmm, I went a little bit off script. And I said, hi, my name's David, David Hill. I'm a realtor. Would you be open to hiring me? And uh, the person paused and said, maybe. And then I was just like, uh, uh, I know I like I started stuttering. I wasn't even sure what to say because Steve's like, well, if they say no, say this. If they say yes, say this. And I was just like, uh, and Steve grabbed the phone right out of my hand and he closed for our first listing appointment. All right now, it's kind of a funny story now, you know, but in reality, you know, like I said, Steve never told us what to say uh, when they said if they said something like maybe. But here's, here's the thing. I'm I'm grateful for Steve. Uh, but in reality, you know, I, I wasn't very, uh, you know, con you know uh, confident in his system. And I came into the, to the business with, with a lot of, you know, experience on the phones. And what I realized is that, you know, his scripts probably weren't the greatest and his system probably wasn't the greatest. So after about four months of dealing with Steve's process and his system, I, I you know, I was frustrated. Uh, I was getting uh, disappointed. So I just said to myself, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And, and, you know, here we are now jump, jumping forward 20 years later, uh, tens of thousands of calls. I have spent over a quarter million dollars on myself in training, uh, personal development. I, I've made thousands of calls, you know, tens of thousands, uh, thousands of hours in the trenches. Um, you know, we've listed uh, a couple thousand homes. We've sold over a thousand homes. I took Steve's process from the antiquated index card system, um, you know, to a system that every morning emails me all the new leads. All I have to do is, is, is go into my system and all the leads are right there, right? From a, from a, I took it from a stuttering, nervous, cold call to a clear way of asking great questions and handling objections. And, you know, from, from, from rejection and disappointment and, and, and frustration to really just a simple process that, that gets me listings anytime I choose to, to pick up the phone and connect with people. 
You know, so I, I know for most realtors today, your process is probably not index cards. I get it, but I, I'm willing to bet that it, there, there are some areas that could be a lot better, a lot more effective. So I'm going to let you know if I can do this, I, I believe anybody can do this. And in the next like 30 minutes or so, um, I'm going to show you exactly how. So let me share with you. Let me jump into this. Uh, hold on. Let me just share my screen. I'm going to get this uh, started. So start right there and slideshow. Okay. Um, Sam, just confirm you can see the uh, bullseye. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, good. So one, what we're talking about today is, is um, bulletproofing. And I, and I said this before is there's five bulletproofing strategies that we're going to get into today. Okay. And, and what they are is number one is buyer's remorse. This is something that, you know, as the market shifts, there's, there's a lot of, of, of fear. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things happening right now that, that creates buyer's remorse. We're going to talk about that. The next thing is inspections. <laughs> inspections can, can be a huge challenge. Uh, in any market, but this market more so than ever, we're, we're going to also uh, talk about appraisals, right? This is another area where we can have a lot of problems if we're not set up the right way and we're not planning the right way. Um, loans and financing, again, another issue. I'm sure anybody, any of you guys that have been in real estate for a while can, can, can appreciate this. Um, and, then, and then finally, communication. I mean, communication is just absolutely critical and it's critical in any market but more so in a market like this and i and i, I mentioned earlier guys i've been doing this for uh november is going to be 20 years so i've gone through a few markets that have shifted up and down and each time we've used these same exact tactics so we're talking about buyer's remorse so the thing i want to say is i want you to expect the best or plan for the worst that's what I'm saying. Expect the best. So I always want to look at things from a positive perspective. And you know, when I teach shift, I say, be an optimist, which I am. But in this case, I want, I want you to stop planning for worst case scenario. You, you want to plan ahead of times, like what can go wrong? And that's why I say plan, plan, plan. So we want to look at what can go wrong. Triggers can go wrong. And when I say triggers, what do I mean by that? I mean, news reports, <laughs> Right, the news. News is out there to 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 get people to view, and and people unfortunately are more attracted to negative stuff than they are positive. You know, I as a matter of fact, I saw an article uh, a few days ago by Inman, which you know, reputable real estate media, and it started off by saying fourteen point seven percent of all real estate transactions fell apart in June of two thousand twenty two, which is you know, probably a fact if they put it out there, right? But it, but my first thought was like, wow, that's a lot. But then I've been doing this long enough to realize, well, about 10% of all real estate transactions fall apart anyway, in any market. That's, that's reality, just because things happen. So what they're not saying is, hey, an additional 4%, because if you read deeper into the article, it actually tells you that last year in June of 2021, 11% uh, of all transactions fell apart. And that was in a strong market. So the real difference is only about 3.5%. But if they said, hey, 3.5% more real estate transactions fell apart this year than last year, probably no, most people are going to be buying into that. So we have to pay attention to those types of things the news people are getting. Also, friends. Friends say things like, oh, God, you shouldn't be buying in this market. Oh, gosh, what are you, crazy? Or you got the uncle, right? You got the uncle that is the, 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 the master of everything that's telling you, well, you know, gosh, with interest rates the way they are, oh, you shouldn't be buying now. Prices are going to go down. All this other stuff. So we have to be aware that this is happening on the other side as we're working with this person. People are going to say things, oh, gosh, you paid too much for that house. So we got to be aware of that. The other thing you want to think about is, is being constantly reselling them on the process, being, not being constantly, constantly reselling them on the process, being there though with them, right? So what does that mean? It means you're always 
reminding them why they're doing what they're doing. So you just, you're in massive communication with them. You know, there's some great tactics. Um, you assure them, you know, that, that it's the right deal. You're staying with them. You're, you're in constant communication. Is, here's, here's a great uh, tactic from the book shift is write a letter. When, when you get to a house, you could actually write it out. Hey, we've looked at 50 houses online. We previewed 10. You know, we, we made an offer on this one. This one has the bedrooms you want. It has everything you want. It's in the right neighborhood. It's in for the school system, for your children, all that. So that when they start thinking, oh gosh, I wonder if I, if I did make the, the wrong decision, you can bring them back to that. So I thought that was a really, really great tactic and just keep reminding them of the benefits. You know, one of the things that, that I do is, is I, is I love to always um, share a story. Like I call it the marathon story where I'm going to let people know, Hey, you know, buying a house in a lot of ways is like running a marathon. You got to go through a lot of things. You're going to probably jump through a lot of hoops. There's going to be times where you're going to be like, oh, God, this is so much. I don't even know if I can finish. And, and that's normal. I ha we have to let people know that it's normal to go through those cycles up and down so that when the expectations come, when, they, when they're feeling this, they're going to go back and say, yeah, you're right. You told me that. You told me that would happen. You told me there'd be a a time I'd be having second thoughts about this. And that's normal. We all go through that. So I think that's really, really important to let people, and here's another, uh, let people know. And then closing ASAP. In a shifting market, you want to get your transactions closed ASAP. You do not want to waste time. You don't, if, if, especially, now if you're at a listing agent, okay, and you get an offer with a long closing, I would be really, really concerned. If you're a buyer's agent, if in, you know, I would try to get your deals 30 days, 45 days max, get them done. You know, make sure as it, the longer things, the longer it's spread out, um, the longer it takes to get to the closing, the more chances of something negative happening or something happening that is going to uh, is going to kill the deal for you. All right. So inspections is the next thing we're going to talk about. I say you can't over prepare for this. Can't. I just don't believe you can. I think you just have to continue to, to prepare. You have to let the clients know everything. You know, and, and the other thing that you want to do is you want to recommend inspectors that you trust. Okay. I, now, when it comes to an inspections, you, you want to set those expectations up front. Right? And then when I say over prepare, I'm, these bullet points are going to explain that to you. But I, you want to think about everything that could potentially happen. So like when I'm looking at a house with a client, like I've looked at enough houses, I can kind of see some of the things up front that may be an issue. So I'm actually preparing them with some of that. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it so that it's going to kill the deal, but I want to make sure that when this stuff comes up in the inspection, there's no surprises. I mean, obviously surprises can come up, but I'm preparing my client for this. Now, if you're on the listing side, over preparing is what? Maybe having an inspection done before you list the property. So you know exactly what you're dealing with. And now you can give that, that inspection to the other agent, or you can even put it on the list on the MLS in the listing if you want. But now recommending inspectors that you trust is key. Okay. There's, a, there's some inspectors out there. I promise you kill deals. And I don't know, some of them I'm going to guess aren't doing it on purpose. Some maybe, I don't know. Some, like, I feel like throughout my career, I've seen inspectors that just do not have any tact. Like some, there's an issue with the house and all they do is they scare the heck out of the poor buyer and kill the deal. So in Massachusetts, where I am, we have a list of appraised inspectors and, and we're, we need to uh, give them the list, which is what we do. And I would highlight a, like three of them and say, hey, and these are the ones that we've done, you know, uh, a, a lot of business with, and they've done a really, really good job for us. But in the end, the buyer is going to pick, but I'm really trying to get them to go with one of the inspectors that I know is going to be fair, honest, but also not kill the deal. We, we definitely don't want that. There's too many inspectors out there. The next thing that's critically important is attending the inspections. Obviously, as a buyer's agent, you're going to attend the inspection, but I'm telling you as a listing agent now, in this type of a market, you want to attend as well. In some markets as a listing agent, I don't even bother attending. You know, when, when people are making offers like last year, 
you know, I'm offering over asking price as is. I'm not as concerned about the, uh, the inspections, but now when things shift, I'm going to be more uh, concerned and I am going to attend the inspection. And here's a little caveat. When you got a property, like, like I, I've been doing this long enough to know if there's, I'll see things that may be issues. I will let the seller know. And then it's even more important to make sure I'm there for the inspection when, when I think issues are going to arise. Uh, practice negotiations. This is something that a lot of agents don't do enough of. Getting out there and practicing the negotiations on your inspection. Like, how are you going to negotiate this with the other agent? How are you going to negotiate it with your client? How are you going to position it? Because I know there's a lot of people, you know, that, that are really, really good with, with serving people and helping people find the right, uh, right property and, and dealing with all that. But then when it comes down to negotiating and, and, and things like that, it, you know, they get nervous. They get a little bit more frustrated. So when you, when, when you, when you, when you practice this, it'll help set you up when you're in the negotiation. So practice, you know, the challenging practice, dealing with a challenging listing agent, practice dealing with a challenging seller. This is what we used to do. I, for 14 years, negotiated every single day, five days a week, I negotiated cold calling. Okay. And then our team negotiated. It's, I think it's really, I practice negotiations. We practice everything. So there's something you probably don't hear a lot of, enough of, but definitely start practicing your negotiations. The other thing I want to put is like, what's next? We always want to let our clients know what's coming up next. That is the highest level of service. Nobody should ever be sitting around thinking, hey, I wonder what happens next. If that's happening, then there's a, there's a breakdown somewhere. Here's something I learned years ago. If the client has to call me, I drop the ball. The client should never have to call me. They should always know what's happening next and then show up to that. And then I'm letting them know I'm staying in front of them. And same thing. Now you do an inspection. Okay. They have the inspection. Okay. Here's what's going to happen next. We're going to create this. Uh, we're going to draft up this addendum. We're going to submit it to the other agent. And we're going to, uh, uh, they're going to respond to us and then we'll go back to them. The other thing that can really hurt your deal, and this goes back to the practice negotiation, is sometimes real estate agents themselves end up killing the deal. And we got to be careful how, and, and this is why the negotiation practice is so important, we got to be careful how we relay information uh, to the other side, to the other parties, to our clients. You know, somebody may say, hey, I'm not going to uh, reduce the price anymore. I'm not going to go up anymore. So how do we relay that to our client is critically important. And we're going to get to that when we jump into the communication part. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is appraisals. Excuse me. Appraisals are, man, you can't say enough about appraisals, right? And here's what I'll say is be proactive. When it comes to appraisals, be proactive. And what does that mean? It means we're going to make things easy for the appraisers. That's our goal. Make things easy, right? So what does that mean? Well, we answer our phones, return their calls quickly, have flexibility on time, right? Be able to get them in. What else? Bring comparables. Like I want to bring comparables to them. And the other thing is I ask them what they need. You know, some appraisers will say, hey, can you send me the offer to purchase? Absolutely. Can you send me a copy to PS? Absolutely. Do you need some comparables? Do you want to see the comparables I used when we listed the house? I'm doing all that. I'm giving them as much information as they need to make the right case because I want my property to appraise. And for you buyer's agents, same thing. Buyer's agents, you don't, you know, if, if you're writing an offer on a property and it, have an idea. If, if, if it's overpriced, then talk to the listing agent and say, hey, how did you come up with the, with the price you're on at? Because I want to know, because I don't want this, thing, this appraisal to be an issue. And we know, I mean, if you've been doing this long enough, you, you can kind of watch the market as some of the challenges we see is something may have appraised for this price, you know, three months ago, but now today, because of interest rates, because of the market, because things are changing, it may not appraise today. So we really got to pay attention to that. And then the final thing with appraisals is pre-appraisal 
Uh, listing agents, this is always an opportunity. Have a pre-appraisal done, similar to the inspection. You can have a pre-appraisal done, just call a random appraiser before you list the house and say, hey, I'd love to get an appraisal just to get an idea of what you think the property is going to come in. Most people aren't going to do that, but some sellers, you know, if they feel like, well, I don't know, you're the agent, I believe the house is worth more, then I would just say, hey, you know what, why don't we just call a random appraiser? We'll get an appraisal done before listing it, and then you'll feel comfortable about the price, and we get it on at the price the appraiser comes in at. So it's not a bad solution for, for um, getting the seller to, to agree. And now you have that appraisal as well for when the other agents come in, and, uh, and maybe you have to justify your price somehow. So it's great, great, again, being proactive. The next thing is the low uh, mortgages in the financing side of it. So again, I'm going to say the same exact thing I said over there. Be proactive. Critical. We, we want to be proactive. All right. Recommend. Okay. So I say recommend second opinion. Here's the thing. Most people come to you, they, they, you know, they have somebody, a friend that's a friend that gave them a mortgage recommendation or, or, or their buddy does mortgages or they went online because they saw a fancy ad from, you know, one of the big uh, online mortgage companies. And I, I'm not, a, I don't have problems with the on, online mortgage companies, by the way. Um, yet what I, what I would want to do is I would want to get them a second opinion so that they're with one of the lenders that I trust and that I know and that I respect. And, and I will just tell people straight out, hey, you know what? I've been doing business with this person for a long time. When they tell you the rate's the rate, that's the rate you're going to get. When they tell you the closing costs are the closing costs, those are the closing costs you're going to get. Um, their rates are very competitive. They usually will beat anybody else's rates. And if they can't, they'll let you know. So you don't necessarily have to work with them, but it definitely makes sense to get a second opinion. And most people will get the second opinion. And, and the people that I'm aligned with, rock solid. You know, the person we use, we use for years is Fairway Mortgage, Bill Murphy, and still use him. I mean, I think I've been using him for like 15 years now. When when he gives me a pre-approval, man, I'm I know that's gonna pan out. I don't even have to worry about it because that's you know, that's the type of mortgage person you want uh, that's that's supporting you and in, in helping your client through the transaction. Uh, the other thing you want to think about when it comes to this is really understanding your client situation more more than uh, even sometimes more you know just as much as the mortgage person or even more. Like maybe your client has a situation where they're getting a gift as part of their deposit. So understand what that means. Uh, maybe there's a VA loan involved, right? They're you in a VA or or an FHA loan, which means, you know, VA, I, I'm actually a big fan of VA loans. I don't have an issue with VA loans at all. I think they're great. I think they're strong. The government's backing them. But sometimes there can be restrictions because if the property doesn't meet the criteria, they're, they, you know, they, they're, they're stringent with certain repairs and things like that. So just understand what's expected. Same thing with FHA loans. If you're dealing with an FHA loan, the mortgage company isn't going to see the property. You as the real estate agent need to make sure this is a property that's going to be able to pass through an FHA appraisal. So really understand your client situation, what type of loan, what kind of situation they're in. You know, are they in a place where they, you know, they're stuck in a lease for a while and they have to buy months out. So maybe if that's the situation, maybe now's not the time to start. I mean, you start looking, but maybe now's not the time to start writing offers. Just understand your client's uh, situation. I think that's really, really important. And then this is from uh, the book Shift, which is, uh, which is Gary's uh, 10 Commandments of the Loan Application. And I, I thought this was really great. So let me, so these are the 10 commandments for a loan application from Gary Keller in the book Shift. And, and I've dealt with almost every one of these. It's been crazy. So though, number one, those shall not change jobs, become self-employed or quit your job. Man, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of people have, have switched jobs. Thou shalt not buy a car, truck, or van, or you could be living in it. I, I'll tell you one of my, in my, when I first got my license, uh, I remember the closing perfectly. The buyer showed up to the, to the day before walkthrough in a brand new Cadillac Escalade. And I was like, oh, nice truck. He's like, yeah, thank you. Uh, we just got it, got it last week. I'm like, awesome. 
didn't even know what that meant until the next day at the uh, at the closing when they were like, "Holy cow, we we can't close this deal now because your your uh, your income ratios are off now because of this truck payment." That that didn't go too well, right? Those shall not charge cards. Do not go buy all the new furniture and all the other stuff until after you've closed on the house. These are all things that we need to educate our clients on. Those shall not spend money you have set aside for your closing, right? You're going to need money for closing costs. Don't, don't admit, uh, omit debts and liabilities. So, right, let them know everything because they're going to find out anyway, right? If you've got a, a $300 a month bill that you pay to, I don't know, uh, a Best Buy, they need to know about that, right? Um, those shall not buy furniture, right? Same thing. Don't go out there and buy all your new furniture now. Wait till after you close, right? Then, then do that. Uh, those shall not originate or any inquiries on your credit. Don't go out there and, and you know, apply at 15 different mortgage companies and, and apply for this and apply for that because it's going to come up, right? Those shall not make large deposits without checking with your loan officers. So before you do anything, check with your loan officers. That means don't like have $10,000 that's been under your you know, mattress for five years, just go throw it in the bank and say, okay, here's my deposit. Cause the bank's going to want to know where that came from. Don't change bank accounts. And, and finally, this is one that we dealt with in the past. Somebody, and she was doing it in obviously good faith, trying to help her, her daughter, but she signed, she co-signed for a loan for her daughter, which then affected her ability now to purchase her property. So we have to just pay attention to this and let your client see this. So I love the 10 commandments and finally communication. And, and, then, and we're, then we're going to get into some, some mistakes and some questions. So number one on communication is, is I like to say over communicate. I don't believe you can over communicate enough, to be honest with you. I feel like if somebody's like, Hey, you're all, you're good, man. Like we, we, I, I still want to, I, I'm going to communicate so much um, that they're going to be like, they're going to probably tell me like, Hey buddy, you're doing such a great job. You don't even have to call me today. All right. I get it. Is everything good? Are you sure you're all set? All right. How you feeling? You still excited about this? Okay. Awesome. Like I want to communicate, like go back to what's next. Like they always need to know what's next. Okay. You know what? We just got through the uh, inspection process. So what's next now is um, the appraisal. So as soon as I hear from the appraiser, I will let you know. So meaning, again, they're never sitting around worried about what's coming next. Over-communicate. Key players. <laughs> I want you to over-communicate with every player involved in the transaction. Escrow officer, lender, mortgage, appraiser, real estate attorney, title company, other real estate agent, buyers, sellers, everybody. Oh, by the way, when I say real estate attorney, there's a little bonus. Make sure they are using a real estate attorney. Some people will say, oh, yeah, my, uh, my cousin's uh, a, a criminal attorney. I'm going to have them do the transaction. I want to avoid that, okay? They will kill your deal faster than anybody else, okay? Besides the fact that they're, you know, most of the times don't even do real estate transactions, can be challenging to get in touch with, but they just don't understand the tact involved in it. So, again, the attorney is critically important, okay? Set expectations up front. Can't say enough about this. Man, setting expectations is absolutely huge. Matter of fact, if you're here with me, just say setting expectations is huge because it is. I think this is probably one of the most important things we can do in any transaction is set the expectations up front. Like, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what you should expect. This is what you should plan for. Everything we've talked about today now, every one of these tactics has to do with setting expectations. And, and I want you to set expectations up front. And I also want you to set expectations through the whole transaction at every step and at every single point. And here, I said this earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Agents kill deals. I hate to say that, but I would say 50% of the real estate transaction, if you take that, that uh, 4% 4, 4 of extra real estate transactions that fell apart this year over last year, probably more than half of them had to do with real estate agents killing the deal. And what does that mean? It means they don't know how to communicate with their clients the right way. They don't know how to communicate with the other parties. 
They're letting their own insecurities, their own frustrations, their own stuff get in the way of their other clients. I've, I've seen agents, just the way they communicate, like the, if the buyer, the seller's agent will say, yeah, the seller doesn't want to take any more money off. You know, they're, they're at a place where they just can't do it. And then the buyer's agent goes back to the buyer. Yeah, yeah, they won't take any more money off. They're super difficult. I don't even think they want to work with us. And you just killed the deal. So again, be aware of this. And that's why I, I'm going to bring you back to the slide where I said, practice your negotiations, practice tact. And here's a, here's a, here's a huge one. Okay, here, here's, here's a big one. And you, you, some of you may know what I'm going to post next, but this kills more deals than, than I think anything else is stop texting important stuff. Man, texting. I feel like we've gotten lazy in a lot of ways. Texting is fine to give an update, but anytime there's something really, really important happening, we need to make sure that we are using all of the skills that we have available to communicate. So as a human being, if you look at communication, when we communicate with people, 55% of our effectiveness in communication comes from body language. So what that's telling you is when you're in front of somebody, okay, when you're like face-to-face -face is great. If you can't do face-to-face, -face, I would do Zoom. If it's a really important conversation, get them on Zoom because you can see my body language now. Besides just hearing, you can see my body language. The next one is tonality. Okay, so if you 55% is body language, tonality is, is uh, in voice. Tonality is, in voice is 38%. So think about that. 38% tonality in voice, 55% body language. 93% of your communication comes from those two. The additional 7% is the words we use. I want you to think about that. Now, go back to what it says here on the screen. Stop texting. The only level of communication you're using with text is words. That means you're 7% effective. I know, it's baffling. Okay, you send a text to somebody, maybe they're in a bad mood, right? Maybe they just, who knows what's going on? There's stuff going on. They just got in an argument with their wife. They, you know, the, the seller's frustrated. They're frustrated. We got to stop doing that. We got to be willing to, at the least, Pick up those phones and, and, and have a conversation with somebody as a human being. That's the key. So we, I mean, I can go down this road all day, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. I just want to let you know, stop texting. Here's the, if you can do it first and foremost in person, the most important calls uh, conversation should be in person or on zoom next level down phone call um, email. If you, if you just can't get on the phone, then an email is better than a text and then text. In my opinion, text is just for an update. Like, hey, here's what's next. I'll talk to you soon. Any negotiation should not be done via text. Now, I'm going to go through a few mistakes with you, and then I'm going to go into our Q&A. One of the mistakes I made is being too transactional. To be honest, for a lot of my career, I was too transactional. I was just focused on getting the deal done and getting to the next deal. Another mistake I made was talking too much. Just love to talk, you know, talk, talk, talk. Here's what I promise you. When you get really good at asking questions, you're going to be a lot more effective. Okay. You should be talking about 70, 30% uh, of the time in, in listening 70% of the time. And when you are talking 30% of the time, 70% of that time should be, I know it sounds like a riddle, 70% of that time should be asking questions. That's what the best of the best of the best salespeople do. Pushing too hard. Man, in the past, I got a lot of transactions closed where at the end, you know, we got the deal done, but the, some of the clients just weren't super happy. Not super happy that they didn't get the deal, but super, weren't super happy because I pushed them through and, you know, it was, just wasn't a great experience for them. So I've chilled out a bit on that. And I've just, you know, be with people, help people go at their pace. You know, if somebody's not ready to do something right now, then understand that up front in your process. And then maybe it's something to do down the road. Okay. And then not digging deep enough, which is what leads to that. When I, when I don't dig deep enough with people, um, 
then it's, it's hard for me to exceed expectations. It's hard to, for me to even understand their expectations. So those are some of the mistakes I've made. Plus, plus to be honest with you, there's, there's, a, there's a lot more, but I'm not going to go into all of them uh, right now. But I do want to just share uh, with you uh, a, an opportunity. So let me um, stop sharing my screen for a minute. And I want to let you guys know, we, you know, right now, um, one of the questions that I get asked, uh, probably more than any is, um, hey, can, can you help me, you know, get more listings in this market? Um, and, and the answer is yes, to be honest with you, uh, because we have people every single day, every week in our community that are taking listings. These are, these are people that are uh, committed, they're accountable, they're showing up. Um, real estate agents. We have a community called uh, davidhill.club. And, you know, it's, it's open to real estate agents. We meet daily, uh, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have two calls a day. It's an amazing community. Uh, right now, we're over 60 members and we're growing really fast. So a great way to start taking more listings. And uh, these are the conversations we have. We talk about not just taking listings, but you know, how to take the right listings, how to, how to, you know, qualify sellers, and then how to ultimately get your, your transaction to the closing bulletproofing. This is one of the topics we talk about on a daily basis. So I can teach you everything we know um, in our community. And you can literally sign up for our community at David Hill. Dot club. Um, that, that's where our community is. And here's what I want to let you know. It doesn't matter if you're a brand new agent and you've never taken a listing before, or maybe, you know, you've, you've been doing this for a while and you've taken some listings, um, but you know, you, you, you want to take it to the next level, or maybe you're taking a lot of listings and you're like, you know what, I know there's even a higher level um, that I can get to, then this is, this is for you. And, and I want you to think about this. So, because, you know, once you sign up for our membership in our community, um, you know, I want you to think about, you know, you're out there taking all these listings and, and I want you to picture a day when you can comfortably pick up the phone anytime you want and, and call anyone with confidence, right? I want you to uh, picture a day when, when you have the freedom and wealth to, to live the life of your dreams. Um, and I want you to picture a day when, when other people out there in the community, realtors are calling you and saying, hey, man, how are you? Like, dude, what are you doing? How are you getting all these listings? Like, wow. Good for you. Well, well, here's what I would say. I mean, the reality is that day can be right now. So what I did was I created an opportunity for, for everybody to, uh, to get into our, our, our community. The community is only $99 a month. And it also includes Cardone University. Okay. Um, for people that want to say, you know what? I don't want to do a monthly thing. You can do the whole year up front if you want. And you get a couple hundred dollars off. It's only $9.97 for the whole year. You can sign up right now at davidhill.club. Um, and my assistant, uh, Sam's going to drop a link in the chat, but it's super easy. You just go to davidhill.club and sign up. And what we're going to do is there's a shift mastermind that we're, we're doing uh, on the 20th that everybody that signs up now is going to get a free ticket to that, to that mastermind. Plus, you get access to everything else. So if you go to davidhill.club, you'll, you'll see what's in the community. All right. So what I want to do now is, um, is I want to open it up to, uh, to some of your, your, uh, your questions. Let me share with you. Um, I want to share something with you guys, and then, and then I'm going to open it up to, uh, to questions. Um, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, it was, it was about, it was 2017. I had uh, joined a, uh, a group of, of real estate agents on a, on a one-year journey. Um, mastermind. And at the first event, you know, everybody at the group was challenged to, to take on a health track. And, and the options were yoga, uh, um, uh, interval training, and, and Ironman race. <laughs> so yoga was seemed wimpy. Interval training was like, okay, I could probably do that. And Ironman race was just hell no. All right. I mean, I did, at the time, I didn't even own a bike. I, and I never uh, uh, ran more than 5K and I couldn't even hardly swim. So the interval was the easy choice for me. Um, you know, so we're at this event. Over the next three days, we got a lot of pressure from the host to step it up to the next level. So if we, we chose yoga, it would be interval. If we chose interval, then they want us to step it up to 
to uh, to the IMAs. So I was pretty consistent with my interval. You know, at the time I was doing CrossFit, I was in good shape, but I knew deep down I could do more. I just knew that. So on the last night, I agreed to step it up to the next level of the Ironman race. And I felt really good about my decision uh, until I, I got to the Ellington YMCA pool and I swam one lap. That's it. One 25 meter lap across the pool. And I, I drank pool water. I was completely out of breath and, and, and I panicked and I'm like, Oh my God. Um, the race, I started doing the math in my, in my head. I said, what have I got myself into? I just did one lap. I'm, I'm almost dying. And in order to complete this race, I'd have to do 84 laps. In my head, I said, impossible. I said, this is impossible. I remember I called my wife. I left the pool. I called my wife. And, and I'm like, I got to get out of this. And my wife's always super supportive. She's like, you can do it. Trust me, you can do it, David. You can do anything you want. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just didn't believe her. So I said, okay. And I hung up and I, and then the next call was to the host. And, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what she said to me, but because uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to say here. But what I will tell you is the thing that I took is he said, hire a swim coach. And, uh, and I was like, oh, I didn't even know they had swim coaches. He said, yeah, get a swim coach and hung up on me. So I went to the YMCA front counter and they connected me with Joel. So, you know, I spoke with Joel later that day. He told me his fee was about $80 an hour. And my first thought was like, I don't want to pay $80 an hour. I'll figure this out on my own. But I agreed to meet him anyway. So during the next four days, I got some help from the lifeguard. And he was not a great instructor. He didn't really have enough time. But he gave me some tips here and there. And I even considered canceling Joel. But instead, I made sure I followed through. So at the first meeting with Joel, he started off by watching me swim down and back. Now here, I'm pretty proud of myself, right? I made it all the way down and all the way back to the other end of the pool with it, by myself. So Joel said, okay, great. And he said, I want you to practice this new stroke. He gave me a new stroke. And he said, I want you to, so he watched me go back and down a few times. You know, I'd go down and then come back and I'd rest for, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, catch my breath, then I'd go back again. And he said, okay, great. I want you to do this for another half hour and then meet me back here tomorrow morning. So I said, okay, that's, that's cool. It's pretty easy. So anyway, over, over the next, uh, you know, I did that. And then the next morning I, I showed up again and, uh, and I was so proud. Joel was there and I, I, I swam back down and, uh, and, and I made it back. And then as soon as I went to grab the side of the pool, Joel said, go again. And I was like, huh? He said, go again. And I was like, uh, now? He's like, yeah, now. So I turned around and I started swimming back. And it was like, oh, man, this is tough, right? And I was in my head and it was nasty. I was starting to drink some water. I was tired. I was really, but anyway, I, I struggled all the way back. And I was, I was got to the other end and I grabbed the edge of the pool. And Joel wa had walked down the side. And then but as soon as I grabbed him, he said, now go back again. I was like, now he said, go back again. I said, Joe, I can't. He said, go back now. And he yelled at me. And I turned around and I, and I started swimming back. And I was like, oh. And, you know, it was, it was terrible. I was, my body was like a straight up eye. I was just dragging my body. But you know what? I, I drank water. It was gross. It was chlorine tasty. But I made it back to the other end. And I always remember when I made it back to the other end, Joel was like, great job. And I was just like, wow. In my head, I was like, wow, I just did four laps. Holy cow. You know, less than a few days ago, I, I, I could only do one lap and I was ready to quit. One lap, I was ready to quit. You know, I drank pool water and, and today I just did four without stopping. And, and here's the interesting thing about this is, you know, I'm willing to bet, I, I, and I'm just being honest, I'm willing to bet that on the first day, I probably could have gutted out those four laps and did it myself. The challenge was there was nobody there to push me to do it. Now, doing no, now, now here's the thing. I worked with Joel for another five weeks. And in those five weeks before Joel left, I was doing 16 laps back and forth. And then eventually more, okay? And then I went and I hired my, my, my triathlon coach. But here's what I want you to know. That whole process with Joel, 
helped me not just break through in swimming, but there were so many breakthroughs in so many other areas in my life, in my business, in, in other areas. And it was just an amazing transformation for me. Joel helped me to push through things that I thought were impossible. Joel helped me to have breakthroughs. And, and those breakthroughs, like I said, showed up in not just swimming, but my business. So, so here's, here's what I want you guys to understand. Because I know some of you guys are listening to me now, and you're like, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty good webinar you did. Not bad. Um, but some of you are thinking, well, you know what? I can figure this out on my own. Or, or, you know, yeah, I'll find, I'll, I'll find someone. I'll learn this stuff for free. I can, I can figure this out for free. And, 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 and here's what I'll tell you. I, I, I truly believe with, with all my heart that hiring Joel was the most important part. The most important part of me, the most important piece, not just part, but the most important piece in me completing that Ironman race in, in doing you know, doing the thing that I thought was impossible, you know, the thing that I thought was impossible, you know, and, and here's what I'd say, you know, that's me at the finish line right there. You know, that's me completing the Ironman uh, 70.3 in Lake Placid. That's the finish line. I mean, I would not have done that if it wasn't for Joel pushing me. So here's the thing I want to let you know, this training this community is the opportunity for you to change your business, the opportunity for you to have a breakthrough in your business, the opportunity for you to do things that you thought were impossible. We have members that never picked up the phone before. We're scared to pick up the phone, but now they are weekly setting up listings with for sale by owners, with expired, with their sphere of influence, using the phones because they've had breakthroughs. So I challenge you to take the next step right now, which is signing up for our community. Okay, and you can do it now, again, by going to uh, David uh, or davidhill.club. My assistant is going to drop, let me put that, that slide up right here. My assistant is going to drop the link in the chat for you. And, and again, right now, for if you sign up today, you can sign up anytime. This is always going. But if you sign up today before July 20th, you'll get an event, a ticket to our, our Shift Mastermind. And if you're watching this after July 20th, we always have something, some opportunity going on. The club's not going anywhere. So you're able to take advantage of this. If you want, you join us for $99 a month, month to month. It's a month to month. If you're not satisfied, first month, we always say go through the first month. And if you're not satisfied, we'll refund your money. And then you can also. Uh, pay for your first year up front, which is $9.97. So you can take advantage of that. We appreciate you being here. So the next step for you is simply register now, take action, and you'll be part of the community. You'll be on the call with us tomorrow morning. So that's the easy choice for you. And I appreciate you being here. And with that, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in the community.